And when they were come, they say unto him, Master. Now, we must understand they were telling the truth now. They had their purpose, but the point is Jesus was master. The disciples called him master. The apostles called him master. All the believers called him master. This is the truth. Although he's coming from them and they had an ulterior motive, but it's the truth. Master, we know that thou art true. Yes, it's coming from ulterior motive, but that's true. That's true that Jesus Christ is true and cares for no man. It's coming from a wrong source, a wrong frame of mind. But that's the truth, that Jesus cared for no man. He didn't have the fear of man. For thou regardest not the person of man. That's true. But teachest the way of God in truth. That's absolutely true. And then they asked their question, which was to catch him. All they had said is the truth, that Jesus had the truth permanent, the truth purifying, the truth that if we know that truth, accept that truth, believe that truth, that truth will take us to heaven. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son shall set you free, ye shall be free indeed. He had the truth. He spoke the truth. Now they wanted to ask him the question that will trip him. We'll give the chance to people to ask questions. And disciples asked Christ questions. Tell us, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Tell us, what shall be the sign of of the end of the world. They ask questions. Disciples have chance to ask questions, but they ask their questions out of a sincere heart. Pharisees also make use of the opportunity to ask questions. But it was to be a question that will provoke him. A question that will set him up. A question that will set a trap for him. A question that will make the people not to believe in Christ. When you ask questions like that, you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. If you're a disciple, if you're converted, if you're a child of God, if the question is coming from your own heart, you really want explanation, that's good. You can ask question. But when the Pharisees send you, and when they instigate you, influence you, and when you put words in your mouth, like they did here, the Pharisees sent them and they were going to ask a question. And he said some things that were true. And now they said, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Why that question? Would it really affect them? Were they thinking they'll pay, they'll pay tribute, they'll pay tax or not? No. They wanted him to answer yes or no. Say yes, pay tribute to Caesar, and the Jews will not listen to him again, and they'll block the way of salvation from their countrymen. Say no, don't pay tribute, and then the government will come and catch him. He's teaching the people against the government. They wanted to trap him. If you're like that, you're not born again. If you're like that, you close the door of heaven against yourself. If anyone influences you, go ask this question. Provoke him. Trip him. Trap him. 
the people who sent you and you running the errand for traditional Pharisees you miss heaven together if you don't repent they ask is it lawful to pay to give tribute to Caesar or not look at the next verse in verse 15 in verse 15 shall we give or shall we not give but he knowing their hypocrisy said unto them why why now what's the problem is this the right thing to do why i came here to show you the way of salvation why I came to link you up with God. Why? I'm dying for your sin. And I want you to leave sin and come to self. Why? Why are you trying to ask a question like this? We came to worship God. And we came to center our mind unto God. We want to be separated from the world. And we want to be attached to the Savior so that we can get to heaven. Why? my brother why my sister this kind of question why tempt ye me bring me a penny that i may see it and then in verse 16 it says and they brought it and it says unto them whose is this image or superscription and they said unto him caesar's in verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto them, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God, and allow us to continue preaching the word of salvation. Your heart belongs to God. Give that to God. He created you. You owe everything in life unto God. Give yourself to God. He says, my son, give me thine heart. Let's leave all that kind of question. Let's prepare for heaven and give unto God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Let's look at number three here. Number three here, tender conscience for purposeful, profitable, teachableness the people were attentive when christ spoke to them they wanted to get to heaven they wanted to have the real grace of god that he brought from heaven so they listen isn't that supposed to be our attitude that we're attentive to the word of God, the word from heaven that will change our lives in Luke chapter 19, verse 47. Luke chapter 19, verse 47, it says, and he taught daily in the temple. But, oh, they come again, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him in verse 48 and could not find what they might do look at this look at this for all the people were very attentive to hear him i pray that's how you will be all the people all the people they shunned the pharisees they shunned the scribes they said here is christ here is savior here is the redeemer and they were all attentive to hear him when we hear the word of salvation we should be attentive the word of sanctification and holiness we should be attentive and when we hear the word of god that is able to save us able to secure us able to preserve us unto life eternal it we, we, we kind of push aside every other interest and we're very attentive to hear him and i pray as we hear the word of god it will do good in every one of our lives in jesus name john 
chapter 6 verse 45 in john chapter 6 verse 45 it is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of god every man therefore that has heard and has learned of the father comes unto me they do not allow the traditional pharisees to hinder them to block their way every man therefore that has heard and every man that has learned of the father comes unto me in verse 47 in verse 47 very very i say unto you he that believeth on me has everlasting life verse 63 it says it is the spirit the quickness the flesh profited nothing the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and they are life all the words we have heard today about rejecting tradition all the words we have heard today about blocking the pharisee away from us all the word we have heard today of his salvation of the holiness without which no man shall see the lord of giving our hearts our mind our soul everything to the word of god i pray it will be a fruit in every heart it will be a fruit in your life and then you have eternal life abundant life a purified life, a transformed life, a gracious life with the grace of God coming into your heart, into your life in Jesus' name. God will keep you in that salvation, in that sanctification, and will keep you in total commitment and devotion to the Word of God. And no Pharisee, no religious traditionalist will be able to pull you away from the path of righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. Rise up and tell the Lord and give yourself and commit yourself totally and completely or reservedly unto the lord let the lord himself do that work of grace in you and all those uh, traditional things and traditional opinions traditional ideas traditional religiosity that the lord will wipe everything away and then uh, you will be totally converted transformed by the lord and there will be no uh, wall of demarcation between you and the almighty god open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to a great service this morning in Jesus' name. I pray that your presence here will meet with the presence of the Lord himself. And his presence and power provision will be in every life in Jesus' name. And I pray that with all your heart, with all your mind, without any distraction your heart will be centered on the revelation of the word in jesus name and the blessings of god will multiply in your life father we well, thank you for this hour thank you for this service thank you for your people here and everywhere we're asking, O oh Lord, that revelation of your word will do good in every life in Jesus' name. And I pray that this revelation will wipe out 
every preconceived idea which is not according to your word in Jesus name Lord I pray that the blessing of your word the blessing of the scriptures will all fill every heart and every life today in Jesus name we thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray and the people of God said Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. Can see that we're coming to Matthew chapter 15, and in Matthew chapter 15, we're reading from verse one. It says, "Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, in verse two, Why do that disciples transgress the tradition of the elders?" For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Verse 3, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Here we find the conflict between the truth and tradition. Here we find the conflict between the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our Lord. Here we find the conflict between man and God. Between man, the hardened man, and the holy God. And we need to take a stand. And the Lord will be asking us, where do we stand? And in eternity, as you want to cross over to the other side, what will determine your eternal destiny and your eternal habitation is on which side did you stand when you were here on earth? Did you stand on the side of the traditions of the elders or do, did you stand on the truth revealed by Emmanuel God with us we're looking at the message today standing for redemptive truth against religious tradition standing we have to stand somewhere either for religious tradition or for redemptive truth standing up for redemptive truth against religious tradition we're dividing message to three parts number one the cause and the cost of religious tradition number two the consequence of corruption through rigid tradition number three true conversion and commitment to redemptive truth look at number one in number one the cause and cost of religious tradition look at mark chapter 7 reading from verse 3 for the pharisees and all the jews except they wash their hands out eat not holding the tradition of the elders they were not holding the recommendation of the doctors this is not about health care this is about religion it's about tradition it's about the conception of the scribes and the pharisees when you wash your hands on the recommendation of the doctors that's why gene that's for your health you don't want to catch disease and you don't want um, bacteria or any bad thing that look invisible to the natural eye but they're real and they can corrupt you and they can give you disease so on the doctor's recommendation on the basis of health they tell us to wash our hands you go to the restroom before you come out wash your hands in fact everywhere anywhere you go you wash
wash your hands when you come back now in this pandemic of COVID, of the COVID of a thing, we're told to sanitize our hands. That one recommendation of doctors because of your health. But this one, this one has nothing to do with the doctors. This is the tradition of the elders. And, and it is not in the old covenant either. You don't find it with Moses or David or the prophets. This is not the revelation of God. This is the tradition of the elders. It came in after the close of the Old Testament. After Malachi, these Pharisees rose up and they called themselves the protectors of the word of God. And they, had quite, they added quite a lot to the word of God. And they had these laws, more than 600 laws that they compiled together and it became more significant to them than the word of God. The Pharisees and all the Jews influenced by those Pharisees, except they washed their hands off, that means often, they did not hold in the tradition of the elders. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it tells us, and when they come, from the market except the wash the eat not and many other things i told you more than 600 things they compiled together many other things there be which they have received and to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables even of tables look at verse 5 it says in verse 5 then the pharisees and the scribes asked him why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders but each bridge with a washing hands in verse 6 verse 6 he answered and said unto them well, as Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 7, it says in verse 7, how be it in vain do they worship me. Those who hold the tradition of the elders, and they are not holding on to the doctrine of Christ. They worship in vain. Their worship might look beautiful and attractive and imposing, but all the same because they do not hold to the truth that brings salvation. They do not hold to the truth that brings sanctification. They do not hold to the truth that makes them serve sincerely. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, not only one doctrine, all their doctrines as a kind of smear or snare of tradition, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. The commandments of men that are divergent from the commandments of God that the tradition they held and those traditions did not save them and then in verse 8 it says for laying aside the commandment of God you see what they have done the commandment of God that brings life eternal life saved life the commandment of God that brings righteousness into our lives they laid that aside, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things. Ye do, verse 9, and he said unto them, full well, ye reject. They laid it aside, the commandment of God, and if anyone tries to bring back that commandment of God, they now reject. They say, no, we've laid it aside. We don't want the commandments of God. We don't want the revelation of God. 
God, ye reject the commandment of God that she may keep your own tradition. Those two things cannot work together. And you have to reject one because before you can receive the other. If you receive the commandment of God, you reject the commandments of men. You shun the commandments of men. You lay aside the commandments of men and you hold on to the commandments of God. If you hold the tradition, the tradition of the elders, you cannot hold the commandment of God at the same time. You have to reject the commandment of God and lay that aside before you can give your heart and your mind and your life and your devotion to the commandment tradition of men. The cause and the cost of religious tradition. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the contradictory traditions against saving truth. Number two, the carnal transgressors against the Savior's teaching. Number three, the callous teachers with no submissive tenderness. Look at number one. Number one, the contradictory traditions against saving truth. As we look at Matthew chapter 15, reading from verse 2, it says, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. And then in verse 3, Jesus now answered them and said unto them, Why? 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 The Pharisees asked why. And Jesus asked why. And it's still based on both tradition and truth. The disciples were standing on the truth and they rejected tradition. And the Pharisees said, why? The Pharisees were holding tradition and they rejected the truth. And Jesus asked, why that question comes with you wherever you stand whatever you stand for why saved why holding on to god why believing the truth and standing on the truth why rejecting tradition why holding on whatever the temptation whatever the pressure whatever the pull why but if you backslide why if you reject god why if your mind your heart is no more on the word of god that prepares us for heaven why if you have trampled under your feet the truth that saves and the truth that sanctifies why? If you are no more having the power, the strength, the ability to stand for the truth against all odds, why? The question always comes, and then when we get to the gate of heaven, and the Lord looks at the records, and you see the record that you were once in the truth. You deviated from the truth. And you backslid, and you didn't come back before you died. The question will be why? And after the why, where? Where will you spend eternity? If you trust, if you depend, if you hold on to the traditions of the elders, to the traditions of men, and you kick off away from your life, the word and the truth of God that saves why but she answered and said unto them why do ye also transgress the commandment of god by your tradition it tells us in colossians chapter 2 reading from verse 8 colossians chapter 2 verse 8 beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. 
traditions of men spoil your life. They destroy your life. They destroy your confidence in the Lord and your faith in the Lord. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For everyone, all that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But the tradition of men will make you to forsake that path of faith and the power of faith cannot work in your life anymore because now you are just for tradition and not for the truth it says beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and being deceived after the tradition of men after the tradition of men after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world not after christ any philosophy any idea any opinion any policy any thing from the world from the wise men of the world from the proverbs of the world from the precepts of the world from the authors and authorities of the world that makes you deviate from christ leave christ oppose christ and remove the commandment of christ from your life that is the tradition of men the tradition of the elders but now we need to look at that word tradition if you go to the dictionary and find out tradition tradition is a neutral word it's just like you have a standard a policy a doctrine an idea by which you are guided and ruled and that neutral word tradition if it's the tradition, the teaching of the elders that makes you go away from the Lord. That is bad. That is evil. If it is um, a tradition, a kind of proposal, a kind of emphasis that makes you to reject and to neglect the commandments of God, that is evil but if it is the word of god giving to you that replaces all the ideologies of the world in your life then it's a good thing look at uh, paul's uh, second thessalonians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 15 in second thessalonians chapter 2 reading from verse 15 therefore brethren stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught whether by word or our epistle the word that the apostles brought to us when jesus said teaching them all things whatsoever i have commanded you and then it says, Lo, I am with you until the end of the world. The traditions taught by a word or by our epistles, all the word of God about Christ, about salvation, about righteousness, about holiness without which no man shall see the Lord that will read in the epistles. It's also referred to as tradition and it says brethren stand fast hold the traditions which ye have been taught whether by the word or by our epistles hold it fast don't negate that 
don't push that away jesus said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature don't only stay in jerusalem don't only stay at the headquarters go ye into all the world now if we're to go into all the world we must send out people from the headquarters or say that there is a need in the north please go there there's a need outside nigeria be the overseer there there is a need outside africa go and be the overseer there that looks like tradition yes yes that's the word of the lord hold on to that tradition that we keep on sending people out from the headquarters and we're sending them to places where the need of the preaching of the gospel is is by the word of Christ it's by the teaching of Christ and we now hold on to that it's even in the epistles separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work have appointed for them Acts chapter 13 verse 2 and all through verse 4 that appears to be tradition that you know they take people from here and they send them there they send them they send them and they remove them from our district from our locality why are they doing that why should we obey that are we following the tradition of men no, hold fast to that kind of tradition that you have been taught whether by word or by our epistle now, Paul the Apostle, our times is said, I tell you this, this is not directly from the Lord, but revealed by the Spirit of God unto, and I think I have the mind of Christ. What do you mean? He says, those who are not married, it were better they stay as I, but not, that's not what God said. But this is what the Spirit of God is saying through me. Tradition, yes, that an 80-year-old man should not marry a 40-year-old woman. Where did you see that? Show me the verse. Show me the chapter. It's not in any chapter. It's not in any verse. The idea is if an 80-year-old man marries a 40-year-old lady, that man, 80 years of age, might die at 85, might die at 90. And the woman, after marrying for 10 years, becomes a widow. And so we say, look ahead. Because Jesus said, who is going to build a house that he will not count the cost? And look at the future. When you're going to marry, you have to look at the future. You say that's tradition. Yes, by the Spirit of God. That's a person that has HIV, another one has HIV, who will build a home or a house and not look at the future that they don't produce a child, sickly child that will have HIV. Show me the chapter and show me the verse. There's no chapter, there is no verse because HIV was not in the world at that time. It only tells you that if you are a normal person, you cannot marry a leper. Because leprosy was in the world at that time. And uh, the leper will be separated away from the camp. And so, since the man that is, um, he, that is holy and healthy cannot marry the woman that has the leprosy, will say the same thing, that contagious diseases will bring more problems in your life. That's the reason why all these traditions are there, but they are based on the leading of the Spirit of God. And therefore, when we're talking about tradition, a tradition is so not, not all negative. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, 
whether by word or by our epistle. Look at chapter 3, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. In Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, now we command you, brethren, these are brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, not after the tradition which he received of us. Us apostles, us your leaders, we gave you this tradition, this truth, the truth that says their own is not the tradition of the elders. This is not for his sake. This is to save and to secure and to keep us in the kingdom of God's soul. Look at all those people that will flout, that will, dis that will disobey the traditions who have said, Apostle, what tradition is this? That whosoever will not work, let him not eat. Show me where Christ said that. He told us that when the Spirit has come, it will guide you into all truth. He says, many things I have which I have not told you yet. But when the Spirit has come, it will guide you into all truth. And that's where that came from, that the Holy Spirit now will guide them and they'll be able to guide the church. So that's the reason why he told them, watch and see if there is any man, any woman that will say, I don't respect those leaders, I don't accept those leaders, all that is tradition. And he classifies the apostles who are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. He classifies them with the Pharisees who are not born again. And so we need to understand when we see the word tradition and understand what tradition is that. Is it from Pharisees? Is it from a spirit led, a spirit taught, a spirit guided man of God, the leader in the church? It tells us beware of the traditions against saving truth. In Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 1, we're looking at verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Verse 16, in verse 16, they profess that they know God but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Look at number two here. Number two here, carnal transgressors against the Savior's teaching. Welcome to Matthew chapter 15, reading from verse 3. But he answered and said unto them, Why? Do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Why do you also transgress the commandment of God, the revelation of God by your tradition? Verse 4, in verse 4 it says, For God commanded, saying, Honor your father, thy father and mother, and he that causeth father or mother, let him die the death. In verse 5, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. In verse 6, it says, and honor not his father or his mother. He shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect 
by your tradition. The tradition that contradicts the word of God, that teaches people against the scriptures, against the Savior's teaching. And these Pharisees were not the only guilty people. There are people today who also are guilty of this. The Lord in his word says, honor your father. And then the teacher in the school will teach the children that this is the age of freedom, age of liberty. And if your father says anything, be bold. Look at your father face to face and tell him, and look at mommy face to face and tell her, that's old school. That's old idea. We younger generation, we don't do that anymore. On which basis? Don't you do that anymore? On the basis of what our teacher said. On the basis of what the hero I see on the billboard. What that hero says, that we are free and we're free from any hold of a father of a mother the people that taught you that they make you reject the commandment of god to hold on to the ideas of men that's exactly what those pharisees did and if there's anyone in the church that says we are the one now in command your father says, don't do that, don't listen to him. Your mommy says, don't, do, don't listen to her. We are the younger generation, and we tell you that this is the way to go. If they have that authority on you, you've lost the authority of the scriptures. And the Pharisees are there to tell you that what the word of God had said, that now these present day Pharisees they know better and they tell you that honoring your father honoring your mother that that doesn't come into this understanding of how to live there's another thing look at Hebrews chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 7 Hebrews chapter 13 reading from verse 7 remember them that have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of god whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation it says remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of god whose faith follow look at verse 17 in verse 17 it tells us it tells us obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you it says obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves it's telling us to respect and to honor the teachers of the world those who teach us the way of salvation and the way of holiness and the way of sanctification those who tell us and teach us from the word of god how to get ready and remain in the lord and get to heaven now there are people who teach our members today and they teach our workers and they teach our leaders they say not necessary to obey the pastor the leader who has the rule over us they say nobody has any rule we're all equal fathers and children all equal ministers and members all equal and the apostles and the assembly all 
equal and so they will teach the members they say if we all do it and we carry the posture of disobedience and the posture of rebellion the man over there will understand we do not obey any leader anymore what we think is good we do and he doesn't know any better what does he know that we don't know and where has he gone we have not gone so we don't respect or not obey anyone anymore those are the pharisees and those are the people that make members of the church to reject the word of God and then to establish their own tradition. But the word of God is still the same. The word of God has not changed. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for the watch for your souls and if they're watching for your souls there are times you'll say that's not right repent of that that way is not good at the way of perdition come back from that but the pharisees that come into our congregation and they may even call themselves workers and leaders or fathers or mothers and they teach a people not to be Getting to leadership in the kingdom of God, in the word of God. Those are the Pharisees that are trying to take heaven away from you. I pray nobody will take heaven away from you. Obey them. Obey them. Uh, not only the general superintendent, of course, you ought to obey him. All our pastors, the local pastor there, who is helping you to go the way of righteousness, obey them. And when we, you know, if you are selected to come and, you know, do anything in the service of the Lord, this is what the pastor said, this is what the GS said, and this is the way to go. If anybody teaches you behind and says, don't go the way of the GS of the pastor, we have taken over from him. Now, those people appoint themselves as leaders, but God has not appointed them Absalom. And so if they tell you, do it this way and do it that way, whoever they are, whatever authority they claim, they are not of God. They are the Pharisees that tell you to do things and to say things that are not according to the word of God. Obey them or will obey. Let me hear you. Amen. You know, that makes the word of God and the work of God easy because then we can say we have a need in uh, Nasarawa State. We have a need in Cardona State. We have a need in Bauchi State. And then we say, please go there. And there's no argument. We're able to do that because we're obeying the scriptures. If anyone, then we'll say, ah, uh, ah. Uh. As in the olden days, no, it's Bible day. The Bible time that was still to obey the word of God. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for the watch over your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. We're looking at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. He is worse than an infidel. What the Pharisees did in convincing the people, the Jews, not to take care of their families, but everything they would have used in taking care of their families, they have already given and laid on the altar. It made those people that listen to them worse than an infidel. When there's a contrary idea, a contrary tradition that tells you not to obey the word of God, but to go your own way, they make you worse 
stern and infidel. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, it tells us, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, one follower, one disciple, and one traditionalist. And when he is made, ye make him to fold more the child of hell than yourselves. You make him the people they influence. They influence them to become worse than they were. They make them to be more sinners than they were. They make their hearts harder than their hearts were. It says they make them to fold more the child of hell than themselves in verse 33 in verse 33 it says ye serpents ye generation of vipers how can ye escape the damnation of hell we come to number three number three here the callous teachers with no submissive tenderness callous their heart seared with a hot iron Matthew chapter 12 chapter 15 <coughs> verse 12 in Matthew chapter 15 verse 12 then came his disciples and said unto him knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this scene Christ did not come to curry the favor of sinners. He came to convert them. Christ did not come to campaign before the Jewish people to lift him up. He was already lifted up. And if you are going to, if you are looking for position, if you are looking for anything from the sky, from the Pharisees, you will not want to offend them. You will not want to say anything contrary to what they already know. And they knew nothing. They didn't know anything of salvation. They didn't know anything of sanctification. They didn't know anything of the righteousness that will lead us to heaven. And if you don't say anything that is different from what they have said, you'll never preach the word of salvation. And you'll never preach the word of sanctification and holiness. You'll never preach blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so he gave the people the word. And the Pharisees were always there. And so if he was avoiding the Pharisees, I can't say that the Pharisees are there. I can't say that the, the scribes are there. I can't say that the Sadducees are there. He'll never say the truth because wherever Jesus was, all these Pharisees will come from wherever they are to Jerusalem and to wherever he was preaching. The same thing with us preachers of today. If we're going to follow Christ, we can't say uh, these people are there. I can't say that. And those people, they are watching for my words. And if I say anything contrary to what tradition they have laid down, then uh, it's not going to make them happy. Then we're not going to preach repentance. We're not going to preach salvation. We're going, not going to lead anyone to heaven. Whoever is offended, whoever is not offended, we will preach the truth. You will preach the truth. And you will stand for the truth in Jesus' name. Then came his disciples. You remember those disciples themselves? They were still having the fear of men. Until Jesus died, until Jesus rose from the dead, they locked up themselves for the fear of the Jews. And so, led to those disciples alone, they wouldn't say that. And they said, Jesus, look at what you've done. Do you know that the Pharisees are 
offended after they heard the saying. What did uh, Jesus say? Did Jesus say, oh, is that so? I didn't mean to offend them. What did I say that offended them? This one that you said they should trample the traditions of men under their feet and lift high the standard of the saving truth of the commandment of God. Okay, that's what offended them. And then Jesus will go back and say, Pharisees, I'm sorry. I heard that you are offended. Did he do that? I can't hear you. No. When somebody preaches the word of repentance and the word of salvation and the word of holiness to take people to heaven, and then he learns that there are some people, Pharisees and scribes, that were offended and they had a confederacy, conspiracy, that because he said that, was well, shut him up. And then somebody comes to inform you, do you know that people are offended by your straight forward message that the tradition of man, any man, that that tradition will lead to hell, that they need to put that on the feet and take the commandment of God that will lead us to heaven. Do you know they are offended if the preacher comes back? He may not say directly, I'm sorry, but if he tries to ameliorate, if he tries to tone down the word of God and says, actually, God loves everybody, and uh, this is an age of love, and whatever we're doing, uh, God accepts everyone. He has negated the word of God, he has the fear of man, and I doubt if that preacher does not repent whether he will get to heaven. I pray we'll all get to heaven. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, But he answered and said, Every plant, every Pharisee, every Sadducee, every scribe, every idea, every tradition, every opinion, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up, rooted out thrown away and thrown into the fire. Give me a good amen. amen. Then he says in verse 14, let them alone. How did you get so near the Pharisees? You knew they were offended. Stay away from their camp. Let them alone. Who came? Who is the link between you and the Pharisees that came to tell you and you are telling me that the Pharisees were offended at this saying, let them alone. How did you have their number? How did you contact them? And what's the association between you and them? You hear my word and you know that that will lead you to life eternal. That's enough for you. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. You understand? I said you understand that ditch is hell fire. If the blind lead the blind, both the blind leading and the blind who are led will fall into the ditch. Explain that. If the preacher is influenced by the Pharisees and they are blind, if the preacher is afraid of the Pharisees and they are blind, if the Pharisees will only accept approve of the preacher who says only what they want us to say, they are blind, will become blind. If the Pharisees are leading and controlling the preachers, then the Pharisees and the preachers being controlled by them 
will fall into the ditch and if the preacher the pastor the teacher who is now totally influenced by the fear of the pharisees but is still keeping on as the leader but he has become blind because of the influence and the fear of pharisees he now leading the blind the preacher and the people will fall into the pitch into the ditch and fall into hell we will not get to hell the eyes of the preacher will remain bright and seeing the revelation of the preacher will not be deemed and the spiritual eyes of the preacher will never become blind give me a good amen and then the people who hear when the preacher is saved and sanctified and steadfast in the word of the Lord not cringing not coward not conquered by the influence of the Pharisees and remains on the word of God then there is salvation for everyone and your salvation will abide in Jesus name we're coming to point number three number two point number two the consequence of corruption through rigid tradition we're dividing this to three parts number one the hypocrites corrupted by inflexible traditions number two has cauterized cauterized means hardened blinded and without any feeling no tenderness hearts cauterized by influential traditionalists and number three heaven closed against incorrigible transgressors look at number one hypocrites corrupted by inflexible traditions we're looking at matthew chapter 23 reading from verse 25 what you want you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter but within they are full of extortion and excess verse 28 in verse 28 even so he also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within he are full of hypocrisy and iniquity that was their lifestyle their hypocrisy had corrupted them they are standing for a tradition in an inflexible manner they were like that some time ago they're still like that today that they are inflexible unchanging incorrigible in their tradition in, in mark chapter 7 verse 13 mark chapter 7 verse 13 making the word of god of known effect through your tradition making the word of god have you noticed how jesus preached faithfully and he preached the word of salvation and those policies were always there to hear but he never repented the lord spoke to them directly and he will mention them ye hypocrites ye pharisees they never repented and they influenced all the Jews under their control not to repent. And if anyone repented, they'll throw him out of the synagogue, throw him out of the temple. Now, what have they gained until today? 2022, 24th century. If you go to Israel, the majority of those people citizens over there is still do not accept christ 
accept his salvation accept his word they are these children not accept him as their messiah because the traditions of the pharisees went on from generation to generation that's the danger of tradition that the tradition does not stop with those who are perpetrating the traditions now after their death they've got enough disciples followers in the church that will perpetrate that same tradition and after the death of that generation they have enough followers that will still perpetrate the same thing i pray that god will root out flush out crush send away all those inflexible incorrigible pharisees that are not there for the salvation of the people but they are there for the tradition they hold i pray they will not influence you in jesus name making the word of god of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered and many such things ye do. Verse 21. In verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. By the way, the Pharisees never mentioned anything like that. For them, evil thoughts not their concern adulteries not their concerns fornications not their concern murders not their concern washing hands washing pots washing utensils washing table the thing that does not take anyone to heaven that was their concern the tradition of the elders but for people repenting of evil thoughts repenting of adulteries repenting of fornications repenting of murders in verse 22 it says in verse 22 thefts covetousness wickedness deceit lasciviousness and evil eye blasphemy pride foolishness in verse 23 all these evil things come from within and defile the man the pharisees were not concerned about cleansing about washing about forgiveness about remission of sin all that concerns them washing hands before you eat outward righteousness and the inward righteousness that makes us free free from sin all that was not their concern i pray we will not be like that look at second uh, timothy chapter 3 reading from verse 7 in second timothy chapter 3 verse 7 ever learning always listening to the message of christ ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth and then in verse 8 it says in verse 8 now as janus and jambres was should moses so do these also receive the truth? Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Let's look at number two here. Number two, hearts hardened, seared, cauterized by influential traditionalists. It says in uh, Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 15. Uh, for this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, or and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted they didn't want to be converted they didn't want to change they loved their position as perpetrators of tradition and they didn't want to give that up it says 
they wouldn't please in lest they should see with their eyes lest they should hear with their ears and lest they should understand with their heart and shall be converted and, uh, and that I should heal them in first Timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 1 first Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith I will not depart from the faith you will not depart from the faith listening to those traditional Pharisees can make a person depart from the faith and looking at tradition appreciating outward righteousness and the tradition and abandoning the truth can make somebody depart from the faith being afraid of the reaction of the anger of the pharisees that have already had total control absolute control on somebody's mind and being afraid of those pharisees traditionalists can make somebody depart from the faith and you just become confused and then tired and you're weary and you say how long will i will i continue combating this and contending with this and once you are tired you throw off your arms and you say there's no point i'm tired you will not be tired as long as there's one sinner to be saved as long as there is one sinner to lead to repentance in your community you will not be tired in jesus name as long as it is true that we need to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord you'll not be tired of holiness in jesus name it's when somebody gets tired it departs from the faith and the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and then in verse 2 in verse 2 speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron having the conscience seared with a hot iron that the conscience is now callous cauterized hardened and truth cannot penetrate anymore and it's done because of the influence of traditionalists look at number three here number three here heaven closed against Incorrupt, incorrigible transgressors. Heaven closed against them. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, and I, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven the pharisees by their being incorrigible inconvertible convertible that the word of god does not reach them to convert them they will not inherit the kingdom of god matthew chapter 7 verse 21 in matthew chapter 7 verse 21 not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Somebody just professing is my Lord, but his life is not touched. Is my Lord, his life is not transformed. He is my Lord, but there is no conversion. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Jesus Christ came to show us how to do the will 
of the Father from the heart. But the Pharisees were opposed to that. Their heart was not in obeying the will and the word of God. Their heart was for their tradition. And it says all those who are not doing the will of God from their heart, they will not get to heaven. And so those people closed heaven against themselves because they were incorrigible transgressors. We're looking at verse 22 here. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. There are people who neglect their salvation and they run after casting out devils, healing the sick, and prophesying. There are people who are looking for the supernatural, but they're not looking for salvation. And there are people who are joyful and happy. The sick is getting healed and demons are being cast out. And they give more attention and more love. And they give more of their devotion to that. Heal the sick, heal the sick, heal the sick, but lose the soul. They lose their own souls and they lose the souls of the people they are trying to get over. And their preoccupation is Jesus heals. Have you had that testimony? Have you had that testimony? Have you had that testimony? And in pursuit, in the pursuit of healing and casting out devils, deliverance, we leave salvation behind. And people are no more interested in salvation, in righteousness, in holiness, in living a transparent life, a holy life. The thing they exalt in their mind and the thing they are looking for, they're inviting people, he will heal you, he will deliver you, he will, you know, put you know money into your pocket, he will do this and that. But to be saved and to live a life that is free from sin. All that is not their emphasis. Now many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. In verse 23, and then will I profess unto them when it will be too late for them to repent they're ready at the gate and they're saying lord open to us we did this in your name and that in your name and at that late hour when the man cannot repent anymore when the pharisee when the sadducee when the people who have been influenced by religion by tradition when they cannot repent anymore when all the things they have concentrated on in the church of the living God, when all those things could not save them anymore, then when I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Depart from me. I never knew you all the time. You are, you know, going here, going there, running here, running there, and you didn't take care of the salvation of your soul, and all you wanted is the spectacular, the supernatural, the healing, the deliverance, so that they'll be talking about that everywhere, prophet so and so, evangelist so and so. Look at what is happening and then uh, salvation is gone uh, and the standard of the doctrine of the word of god is done and no place is given to the holiness without which no man shall see the lord then uh, will i profess unto them uh, i never 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 knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity i pray that will not be your lord I said that will not be your Lord, and then that will not be my Lord. Going about, it's good to go about. If we preach what Christ commanded us to preach, 
that will preach the gospel, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of transformation, the gospel of a changed life, the gospel that prepares people for heaven. If that's what we're doing, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not just healing, not just deliverance, not just miracle, the gospel of a changed life. I pray that gospel will never depart from us will never depart from you that's your mind your heart your devotion will remain in the gospel that jesus preached and telling the truth telling the truth everywhere matthew chapter 18 verse 3 in matthew chapter 18 verse 3 and said verily i say unto you except ye be converted and become as little children. I was talking to his own disciples. Can you say that you have become converted? Can you say in all sincerity, looking at the condition of your heart, looking at your disposition, looking at the influence of your life, can you say that you are converted, you have become as a little child. A little child humble, a little child tender, a little child willing to learn, a little child willing to follow, as a little child willing to follow the way of the Lord. Or are you as proud and pompous as the traditional Pharisees? that will not learn anything from anyone. And said, verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I pray the door of heaven will not be closed against any of us in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, true conversion and commitment to redemptive truth. True conversion and commitment to redemptive truth. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the conversion from past and present traditions. Number two, total commitment to permanent and purifying truth. Number three, tender conscience for purposeful and profitable teachableness. Number one, number one, true conversion from past and present traditions. Acts chapter six, verse seven. It says, and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The priests who